Hello everybody, my name is Tim Stratton, uh, and today I'm going to be going over briefly some of the tools that we have available for doing untargeted analysis, uh, which is, of course, a very challenging uh, topic because we have an unknown number of compounds in our sample and we don't know which ones are the ones that are going to be of interest for us. Uh, a good example of this is analysis of PFOS. We don't know exactly how many PFOS chemicals are out there in the world, and there's precious few standards that we have uh, to put into spectral libraries. Those of you not familiar with Compound Discover, uh, it is uh, a workflow-based data processing tool. So you see a workflow here. Uh, each of these nodes are different processing steps, and you can drag and drop and connect these together to create customized workflows to do just about anything. Uh, in addition, you can also write your own nodes and plug them into the application. Uh, and for those of you who like, we just provide a series of templates of pre-made workflows as well to get you going quickly. So one of the big approaches that we like to advocate with uh, Compound Discover is the use of orthogonal uh, parallel different uh, detection techniques. Uh, so of course, we're going to do things like searching online uh, spectral libraries. For us, that's MZ Cloud, of course. Uh, searching uh, offline libraries as well, uh, either libraries that we, can, we provide uh, or libraries that you may build yourself. But not all of these compounds will be in libraries, especially with PFAS. There's so few standards available. So we can use other uh, techniques as well, things like compound class scoring. So briefly, what this is, is the idea that we have compounds of interest in our sample. Some of them we may know, we may have uh, reference material, we have uh, you know, a, a entry in a fragmentation spectral library, maybe even retention time information, but then there's all these other compounds. Well, they're going to be structurally related to the ones that we already know, you know, per, per, per and polyfluorinated uh, compounds. So they're going to potentially share at least some fragmentation with compounds we know. So we can take all the compounds we know and from them glean common repeating fragments. So an unknown might give us a similarity hit to a library. That's great. But if it's fragmentationally not similar enough, we may miss it. So compound class scoring goes along and tries to take the approach of saying, well, here's all the fragments I see in common. This compound happens to have two of them. It's maybe interesting for you. So it's, an, again, or, about orthogonal techniques to try to find things. We can also do a search against uh, online databases. So uh, searching something like the uh, EPA DSS Talks is a good example for this. But we can also search offline uh, databases. So these we call mass lists in Compound Discover. Uh, and we provide a few of these as well for use. So just to go into some detail about those lists and libraries, for compound class scoring, we create a, a list. We can create multiple lists and use them as well of representative fragmentation data. And we provide two of these to use with PFAS. And it basically, it's just a list of potential fragment ions that are commonly observed with uh, pern polyfluorinated chemicals. And we'll show uh, in just a moment what that looks like in a set of results. We also provide mass lists for searching uh, offline. So again, offline databases. Uh, we provide three that we use for PFAS, one that has uh, 10,000 compounds here. We have a couple of others at the bottom of the list here. This one has about 4,300, I believe, uh, different uh, potential PFAS compounds. And we're going to be adding to this as well uh, and, and trying to increase our coverage of potential PFAS compounds. So let's look at some other results. So within a set of results, we're going to get several hundred, maybe several thousand different unknown compounds uh, in our uh, data set, depending on the type of sample we have. Taking uh, effluent from an industrial site, for example, might have four or five, 6,000 different chemicals in it. It can be extremely complex. Not all of them are going to be compounds of interest to us. Uh, we can identify quite a number of them doing library searches against, say, NIST or against MZ Cloud or both of them in combination. But we're not going to be able to identify everything, and we're definitely not going to be able to identify compounds that are not in the library. Again, with PFAS, this is a real problem. But we can use some uh, additional tricks. I want to step back one moment to the uh, processing workflow and bring in an additional uh, technique, an additional tool that Compound Discover provides, and that is the scripting node. I mentioned before that you can write your own nodes and plug it into a workflow, but you know, if you're, you're uh, tech savvy enough to say use R uh, or Python, but not maybe write an entire node, you can still use the scripts that you can use uh, in R or Python with the scripting node. What the scripting node will do for you is it'll take the data you need from your result, pull it out, run your script, take the output from your script, and put it into the result data table for you. I'm going to show you an example of this based around the, the recent Kaufman et al. publication on using the 
carbon normalized mass and mass defect of compounds to start to separate them out. PFOS compounds have kind of a unique fingerprint here. So we ran that with this workflow and that injected some additional columns that you can see here. This is the molecular weight normalized to the number of carbons and the mass defect normalized to the number of carbons. Now we can create a plot of this where we plot the mass normalized to carbon, this, versus the mass defect normalized to carbon, and we create a plot like this. So we zoom in here on these compounds within our uh, data set plotted on this mass, to car mass normalized to carbon versus mass defect normalized to carbon. Why does this work? If you haven't read the, the publication yet, I, I do highly suggest that you, that you uh, check it out, but the idea is very simple. Per and polyfluorinated compounds have a lot of fluorines, obvious, built on the, the same uh, skeleton. So you're replacing something with essentially a nominal mass of one with something that has a nominal mass more than an order of magnitude higher. The mass relative to the number of carbons climbs very quickly, meaning PFAS compounds on the x-axis tend to be on the right-hand side. Generally, it's in the range of 35 and above. That's where most of those PFAS compounds tend to be. Now, fluorine also has a negative defect. It's one of the handful of, uh, of elements that does which means that it generally has to uh, mass defect normalized to carbon that is below at, uh, at zero or below. So we're kind of zooming in in maybe this region right here. This is where most of the PFOS compounds, even the ones we don't really know, are going to be. So we can quickly come in here, check all of these, and then you see the, the data updates in the background. But again, I mentioned we're looking at orthogonal techniques. We want to use more tools to try to identify these things. So of course we can look at compounds that give us uh, a spectral library hit. So we can open up the related tables, go to MZ Cloud, and see that for this one we got a pretty good library hit. So we can see the matching fragment ions uh, with the query on the top, the library on the bottom. But not everything's going to give us a library hit, obviously for PFOS, because again, so few uh, pressure, few standards but we still get information on these compounds with things like the uh, compound class coverage or the fact that this has already been checked because it seems to have that right mass to carbon, mass defect to carbon uh, space. So it's a candidate of interest for us and mass lists. So if we look at the compound class matches, you can see this compound had matches in uh, both of the classes. What this is basically saying is, well, here's the fragments that are in the list of things that you say a lot of PFOSs will have, and this compound has those same fragments. If we hadn't gotten a library hit, we would still potentially be interested in this because we've got a couple of lines of information coming together saying, well, this is potentially an interesting compound. One of the last ones uh, that I really uh, enjoy using is to make use of the molecular network. So a molecular network for those of you not familiar, looks at the entire data set and takes every compound in that data set and calculates how much it looks like others based on fragmentation. How fragmentationally similar is one peak to every other peak in the data set? And then you can plot that in a network. And based on the thresholds that you have for score and coverage uh, or, or just raw matching number of fragment ions, things start to connect together. You can also require that they, ha they have an explainable transformation. Those transformations are completely customizable. You can create your own list of what those transformations are, or you can simply require that they match by fragmentation. And of course, if you can identify even one compound in your data set, you can see all the compounds that have that in the name. These are compounds that we've potentially identified from, say, a library hit. You get a starting point. So you can jump off and say, well, what's this one compound connected to several others? You can see the PFBS right here, and we can look at the connectivity it has to other molecules. So the line between it is the connection between these two different chemicals. So we started with uh, this one down here, and the difference is basically just three CF2 units between these two. And this is the kind of thing we expect to see with a lot of uh, fluorinated chemicals, but it also starts to help us with a compound here. The green ones are identified by something like a library hit. Uh, and have some form of annotation. So we have something like this that's connected to another compound, and the ones that are blue may have an annotation from like a database, but they're not robust annotations. But this is kind of what we're looking for. 
not only does this seem to have you know the right formula or the right molecular weight to match something but it's fragmentationally similar to something else it's kind of pointing us in the right direction saying well yes this is similar to something we were more confidently able to identify so it's a potential component of interest and that's what we're looking for especially we're looking for compounds that have no real annotation maybe not even a formula that get connected into these networks because they're fragmentationally similar to something that we have a bit more confidence that we know. So we find using these orthogonal techniques, we find the components of interest, we can assemble things like a molecular network and start tugging on that network where the things we know help us find the things that we don't yet know. So just a brief overview of a lot of the tools that we have in Compound Discoverer, we could go into far more details on this, uh, but thank you for your time and for your attention.